Hey, I think this is happening. I think we're live from uh, the Bronx in New York. This is my first uh, True Fire uh, hangout and workshop. And I'm just going to check something over here, make sure uh, I've set everything up properly, that uh, we're actually live. Um, hold on. Oh God, I do hope I set everything up here properly and uh, that you can see you can see what's going on here. I think we're broadcasting, so I'm just going to forge ahead. Um, welcome. Um, we have an uh, ability to chat with each other. I'd love to know your questions, and I see my friend, uh, a friend from Italy here. Wow, we got, man, I think we got people from all over, so please chime in because I'm here to help you and your questions really um, guide me. What I want to talk about is something that's really, really important um, about playing jazz and improvising. and Not just jazz, I think just any music, harmonic music, right? It doesn't have to be just jazz. Um, and that's about making melodies from the chord tones and, and exploring the form and the harmony and that should be the source of your melody so a lot of people ask well what scales should i play and to me that question doesn't really lead anywhere uh, because it's not a matter of scales it's a matter of harmony and and chords so what i want to talk about is um how do, how did first of all exploring where are those chord tones so what I'm talking about most important thing is the third and the seventh of the chord so when I'm playing lines the third and seventh is always there I mean I could play all kinds of substitutions all around it but if I don't have the third and seventh I don't have the chord in there so I thought I'd take this song uh, the days and wine and roses great standard uh, Henry Mancini tune um, and just give you a couple things to work on some things to think about and then hopefully you'll have some questions and I'll, I'll do my best to uh, to uh, uh, demonstrate things so if I have this melody F major 7 the most important notes to me are that 7th and 3rd so I'm playing mm -hmm. these I'm either gonna be playing these to start and, and this is where I suggest this work them out on your fourth and fifth string and your third and fourth string so this is a first off just a really simple way to voice a melody you don't need to know big chords or drop twos or drop threes you really need to know where the thirds and sevenths are so if i were to disharmonize the melody of that song and always have a third and seventh underneath it mm -hmm. So I'm always playing the third and seventh, either on my third and fourth string or my fourth and fifth string. There's so much going on there. Um, particularly if you're playing with a bass player, you don't, first of all, you never need to play a root. Even here, just hopefully as I'm playing this for you, you go, oh yeah, I can hear the song. So I have. Third and seventh, always the third and seventh. Is right there really three notes I have a melody on the top and then the third and seventh underneath it so you know if you listen to great piano players which I hopefully you do I know I do Bill Evans or Bud Powell or Barry Harris or Horace Silver or, and, and you know that's really what's going on in the left hand is they have a third and a seventh and they play a melody so from that knowledge 
definitely if you're playing, you know, trio or in a quartet or whatever, that's a really a big sound to just the melody in the third and seventh. So, so I guess this is a starting point at first in terms of finding where they are. So, you know, if I took this whole tune and just... and play through all the thirds and seventh. That's a really important thing to do because when I go to solo, those notes are always going to be in my melodic line. And in fact, all the good melodies are there. You can't escape. If you want to be play good melodies, which is really what improvising is, right? Creating melodies within the form of the song, I've always got to know where that third and seventh is. So that this is where a starting point that, that I would suggest for you is first go through and just in those adjacent strings and start on those low strings because again you can use them for comping later on and you can use them to harmonize a melody but ultimately you're going to use them to create a solo so either as a starting note or an ending note of my phrase so I, I guess the, what I'm always looking for as a player is that um, if I would start improvising without you know just on my own just i'm sitting here playing melodies that you will be able to hear the form of the song that is what my intent is when i'm playing so i'm not thinking about playing all the scales that go in all the key i'm not really i'm not a scale person at all and i know i know i see some folks here um that have studied with me either here and true fire other places so i know you've heard my rap before about this um you know there, there aren't any scales that are going to fix your problem this is really where the, the starting point, and also it is not only just like a fundamental starting point. It is the it's the point forever on after. All we learn later on to say, oh, this is a more advanced type of line, are ways to embellish those, to extend the phrase around those. But without those thirds and sevenths, I don't I don't have a tune. I don't have the form of the tune. So, so I'll give you an idea. I, actually, I have a, a, just the bass line loop on my looper, and I'm just going to take a solo and just so so. Th I guess this is sort of the starting point I'm talking about. If if I were to work or you to work on these fourth and fifth string and the third and fourth strings, so just learning where those are. You got to know where those are. So just playing the third and stuff, and I'm always going to play them in my in my line. So if I start here. There was always a third and seventh there, I, I, and you, and it always will be. I mean, that's just that's how I play. Well, that's how I play, and that's in my opinion how a good jazz line should say, sound like. So, and just one more. I, I see some questions coming up, which I definitely want to answer. I just want to give you one more example of that. If if I were to play without the bass line, so you're hearing that in context. If I was just playing with a bass player playing, right? If I was now that you've heard the harmony and the melody a little bit, if I were to just start to play lines on it, you're going to hear exactly where I am in the song. To me, that's my obsession in life is harmonic clarity. And that's really what I'm talking about here is the harmonic structure of the song is always present. You can hear exactly where I am in the song. 
fact, if you even sang the melody along with me, you'd know exactly where I am. So anyway, if I were to count this out, one, two, three, four. <laughs> So that's one chorus of the Days of Wine and Roses. Thirds and sevenths are always there. So I can't, you know, again, I, I'm just constantly saying this to all my students is you got to know where those are. That's the starting point. Learn you know, scales, whatever, scales, scales, whatever. Uh, really nothing that I did there had much to do with the scale. You know, I mean, the scale is like, you know, this compared to, it's like a little grain of sand on that beach or that, you know, or, or, or even a grain of salt in the ocean to me, that scale. The bigger picture is the harmony and the form and uncovering that and developing my melody through that. So I'm going to look through here some questions. Um, yeah, so, so Monty has a question. I, I'm focused on the fifth and fourth strings most. Yeah, I mean, I think that I, I often recommend that as a starting point uh, because you can use that for comping later on. So for instance, when I, if I'm playing with a bass player, I can just comp or I'm, you know, I'm playing with a horn player or in rhythm section. I can just comp with these two notes here. It's a good meaty area of the fretboard. I think a little lower for comping is a little uh, too dark and it might be too high up here, but, but uh, yes, definitely explore them on all the adjacent string groups. Um, you know, that one uh, thing about that, to start to develop chord voicings around these. So talking about these as being essential for soloing, um, if I have, you know, they can make a nice spread. I really recommend, well, listen to Bill Evans, the piano player, um, and listen to Lenny Bro, the guitarist who was obsessed with Bill Evans. Um, and this is a lot of the ways that he, he voiced things. So for instance, F major seven, if I had the E and the A down here on my fourth and fifth string, and I maybe I put a, a tension, I put the ninth on the second string. Now, on its own, it doesn't sound like much. But keep in mind, if I'm playing with a bass player, that sounds huge. Or so, so you that's sort of the thing is you if, if you play the third and seventh down here in terms of comping and developing three note chords. Um, you get a nice spread in there. And and really, I think in the range of where the guitar is, you know, so many guitarists, they just play these, start with these big chords. You don't need that. You need to actually, the less is more in terms of how you orchestrate in an ensemble. So if you experiment with something like that, I could put the ninth there, or I could put even, uh, I could put even a bigger um, spread would be if I have the seventh and third here and then the sixth. Let me play it on an E major 7 so you can hear these. I mean, that's a beautiful chord. It's three notes. It's very Jim Hall also. But, of course, Jim Hall and Bill Evans, they were really good friends. <laughs> I, think they, I think they hung out a little bit and discussed this. But, but so I think, again, back to bring that back to uh, that question, and what I was talking about is, yeah, you can start there because you, you can use them a lot to develop your voicings and again comping it, listen to Jim Hall I mean he's uses two notes sometimes I mean that's all you really need you know when you're playing with the rhythm you don't need these big block chords or even drop two or drop three I mean that's a whole topic 
But again, this will all relate. So I guess what I'm trying to say is by really uncovering these thirds and sevens, you're opening the door to be a better soloist, more melodic soloist, and a better comper, um, and and understanding the harmony. So, wow. I'm, so I got a question from Nick. Do I think arpeggios more than scales? Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yes. I I mean, arpeggios are are great. I think what I'm. This is really even the more of the core, the essence of the arpeggio. But to to connect those thirds and sevenths, yes. I mean, I guess if you think about this, if if on any tune, you know where the thirds and sevenths are. A melody is about connecting those thirds and sevenths. So how are all the ways I can get there? I could get there through an arpeggio. So if I wanted to connect this, this, or for instance, if I have F major seven here, and I want to connect that A and E, of course I could add those other notes of the arpeggio. But, but also, I could get there through the scale. Right? That's a melodic phrase. But again, the core of what I'm basing that around so my target is the seventh of that, or I could go the other way. You know, the, I start on the seventh and set up the third. Um, or I could get there chromatically. Or some kind of what we call melodic embellishment around the arpeggio and the chord tones. That, those are really the, the techniques for creating great melodies. I mean, just transcribe a Clifford Brown solo <laughs> it's you know you'll you'll know everything, but you know th but they're the same principles that Clifford Brown and 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 Charlie Parker and and Mozart and Bach really they were all on to kind of on the same thought process in terms of yes using chord tones arpeggio sequences uh, melodic embellishments you know what we call melodic embellishments um, to to create melody so so I guess I could create a melody by using the arpeggio to the chord tone, I could use the scale to the chord tone, I could use some kind of kind of stuff like that little melodic embellishment. I could, uh, or I could just leap there from nowhere, I guess. But I guess, no matter what, that, that's where I'm seeking to resolve my line. I'm either starting my line on a third or a seventh, or I'm resolving it in there, but it's always in there. If if it wasn't in there, you wouldn't hear the song. So um, let me see what other questions we got. Um, what is this question here? Oh, what is what are drop two chords? How do you make them sound good? Well, practice. Um, drop two chords. We could. Go there. I mean, a drop two, I'll just kind of briefly say a drop two, or you might hear this term drop three, drop two, drop three, drop two and four. They refer to a voicing system. So um, it's not just a guitar thing. If you were arranging for a big band, for instance, Duke Ellington used drop two chords or drop two and four chords. Um, so it's a system of voicing chords that actually happens to work great on guitar. Wes Montgomery uses, I mean, everybody, you know, it's kind of a core of jazz guitar playing. Wes definitely used them a lot. Pat Metheny uses them a lot. Um, so it's an idea where, for instance, I could take a chord like this, say I had a G minor seven chord, a closed position G minor seven chord, so it means that I'm going to drop the second voice from the top of that voicing, which is a D, down an octave. So it opens up the chord. And it, so this would be the, uh, the result of that. But did I do that right? No, I want, to take the, I want to take the fifth down. Sorry. The result of that is actually this. Sorry. Ha-ha! Because I take the fifth down an octave. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a drop two. I'm lying to you. This would be the result of that. If I took this chord and I dropped the fifth down an octave, I'd get this. So this is an example of a drop two. And you've probably played drop two chords not realizing that's how they were constructed. So it's more of a system of organizing uh, chord voicing, your basic chord voicing. So then 
it, if I got if I worked out all my drop two chords, I could play all the inversions of my G minor seven chord, and these would be drop two inversions. So that's sort of a you know three second explanation of what a drop two is. But but you know keep it in mind that you know you're going to hear this term a lot, and it's it's not just a guitar thing, though we're very lucky that it works out really well on the guitar. Um, yeah, so yeah, somebody has a question about the inversion. Yeah, so so there there are four inversions of a core of a seventh chord, right? There's four notes in it, so we can just rearrange them, keep rearranging them. So there are four inversions um, of drop twos, there are four inversions of drop threes, there Four inversions of drop two and four, um, and you know there are a lot of things about the drop drop voicings, or even you know even if we just say drop twos, in terms of opening up, organizing the fretboard around them. You know, if you have four inversions, gives you sort of four areas to to uh, segment the instrument into to organize your harmonic ideas and melodic ideas. Uh, they're also really great for comping uh, if you're playing with a rhythm section. Uh, they're also really great places to build on. So, I mean, even I'd have to say the weirdest chord voicing that I know, probably at one time started out as a very simple drop two, and I started to mess around with it, and then it turned into something like this, maybe. <laughs> Sounds very exotic, and it's no longer a drop two, but I started there building. So I think if you're at this point of asking that question about what are drop two, drop three, whatever, um, that's a great place to be and in a really important part of your study, I think, that will open up a lot of doors for you, comping, chord soloing, and then just developing your mastery of, of harmony and... and, and uh, the colors that you produce when you play chords. I mean, if you only have one way that you play a major seven chord, you need to start to look around maybe at some of those because that's a big part of your freedom and your creativity as a player as as, uh, as chord voicing. So um, anyway, you know, you're welcome. Maybe may, and maybe at some other time we can really, really dig into drop twos uh, as a class in itself. But, you know, hopefully that will keep you – curious to figure out what's the next day what co what comes after that so what what other questions do i like pat martino style of course who doesn't <laughs> who wouldn't um do you use this voicing these voicings to yeah um well so there's a question there that's cool i like uh do you use this these voicings and I think maybe in improvisation of course I do I mean uh, this big part of playing the guitar that that unfortunately a lot of guitar players don't get to uh, is that we do play a harmonic instrument and we can express ourselves through chords so I could take a chord solo with drop twos um, I could play it on this song I could go strictly 
exactly drop twos, but they kind of come out of that style. It's very West Montgomery type. Um, so I, that's, I guess, what I'm saying in terms of if you start to get into some of those drop twos, you can start to open up this world of improvising with chord. You know, I, my, I came from a family of really great piano players, professional piano players, and so maybe there's a part of me that is a little a frustrated piano player that, you know, I used to love to hear how a piano player would be able to harmonize every note in the scale and every note in the melody. And I mean, that's such an awesome thing that the guitar can do that, uh, you know, if, the, if you're just asking these questions, these are great questions because you're about to open the door to, you know, the best stuff on the guitar, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so anyway, what other questions do we have in there? I love Pat Metheny, Kurt Rosenwinkel. Uh, I don't see really see their styles that different from tradition from the tradition um, at all. In fact, I know that they've all checked out the tradition, and um, and and actually, you know, I have a lot of thoughts about that in terms of, you know, I went to Berkeley. I I started out playing um, all the Charlie Christian stuff and all the Joe Pass stuff and Carl Kress and all the old stuff. Man, it was awesome. That was my upbringing. My upbringing was really playing chord solos and. Bucky Pizzarelli stuff. And when I went to Berkeley, I, you know, I got into Ralph Towner and Mike Stern and I you know all the modern stuff. And uh, as I moved forward, though, and I, you know, I moved to New York, I got way back more into the tradition. But I really understand. I really understand how it all connects. I mean, if you talk about a player like Kurt R Rosenwinkel, he didn't come out. He wasn't hatched out of an egg. <laughs> <laughs> he comes from a tradition. I know he likes to he'll like to tell you that you know he wasn't influenced by anybody, but I got news for you. He's done his homework on on Clifford Brown and Charlie Parker and and Cannibal. I he's done his homework. So, you know, he's he but he's got his own sound and his own thing, but to me I don't I don't hear it to my ear it's not any different. It comes out of the same tradition. And it really comes out of this stuff actually when I go back to the beginning of playing all the chord tones he the heart the changes are there you know he could just play lines i know what song he is i know I'm playing and i know where he is and the reason that is is because he's still coming out of uh, out of the tonality out of the out of the chord changes so um again he's just got more what we say maybe more contemporary techniques to embellish those those chord tones but he's he's a tonal player so, so in that way, he comes out of the tradition to me. So I think, you know, I think a great thing to do is do a lot of listening, listening, go back, you know, take a tune. Uh, one of my assignments for some of my students at Berkeley is to take a tune like Body and Soul and listen to, go back and listen to Coleman Hawkins play it, listen to Bird play it, listen to Coltrane play it, listen to Chick Corea play it, Herbie Hancock, you know, listen to what stays the same and what changes through time. And there is this, what I'm talking about, this essential thing of the chord tones and the form of the song is always there. There are different techniques in terms of, harm, you know, melodic approaches and harmony that you can add to that shape, but you still can't ignore the thirds and sevenths of, if you're gonna play body and soul, you can't ignore the thirds and sevenths. Everything's gonna come out, or you're not playing body and soul. You're playing something, but it's not body and soul. So I think we can all learn a lot from just listening and observing uh, these, the, you know, this principle that I'm talking about through through time. And then you'll really see how Kurt Rosenwinkel connects to Coleman Hawkins. It's not they're not unrelated to me at all. There's actually a line that goes from that from Coleman Hawkins. To Kurt Rosenwinkel, and it's it's very clear to me what that is. But 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 you know, I think I think we all need to do, and, and I say that about myself, really do more listening. I think the more you listen, the more you understand. Um, yeah. Okay, Monty, I see what you said there. Uh, he, Monty Craig's talking about um, Kurt's clinic on thirds and sevenths, of course. 
I rest my case. <laughs> um, and that's actually a great class because he does that whole thing where, and I think, th you know, this can connect to this too. Now, uh, in his class, I'm going to show you what, he, what, what he's talking about because it's also an incredible thing for solo guitar. So when I was talking about harmonizing the melody using the thirds and sevenths on adjacent strings, this would be the idea, and this is exactly what, what Kurt's talking about. Now, he's talking about organizing the, the fifth and the, root and the third. So if I was going to play F major seven, here's the fifth and the third, here's, and then the root and the seventh. So these are your two shapes, and this actually connects to my dear friend Jimmy Weibel, turned me on to this stuff. Uh, and, and actually, you hear Thelonious Monk do this, and um, and Bud Powell, and uh, and uh, my Earl Garner. So, for instance, if I'm going to think about F major seven, I might think about it as something like that. So I could harmonize the melody. Oh. So anyway, well, I'm just so I'm kind of playing through those almost as arpeggios. But anyway, check he could he could show just look up that that Kurt Rosenwinkel. Um, video on that so third and seventh but so there's a question from Brad what's the best way for a blues or rock player to start learning how to play jazz how do you start learning to play jazz find a good teacher <laughs> no. um, listen you know what listen to the music first I think if you don't love it you know I, listen to Wes Montgomery and, and and be curious I mean that that was for me. I was a rock player, as a heavy metal player. I still and I still am. I still love to shred. I, I'm called on to shred in my professional life. I love it. Um, but I heard actually I, I heard uh, Charlie Parker, and I heard uh, Sonny Rollins, and then I heard Wes. I'd kind of stumbled upon it, and I was so curious, and I was very moved and touched by this music. So I didn't understand it. I was not born being a jazz player, and and my you know my family were classical musicians, and and uh, working musicians you know church musicians and show tunes, but not jazz musicians. So when I heard that, I was so curious. I mean, I would just listen to this music all the time, and so I wanted to find out about it. And I found a teacher nearby, who really got me into playing. First of all, chord solos. Um, you know, misty and uh, you know all things you are. Just being able to harmonize a melody, the whole thing. So actually, you know, I I learned a lot of chord voicings. I learned a lot of tunes. I learned about melodies. Plus, you know, these songs were all songs that, that were familiar to me from growing up around musical theater and stuff. So it wasn't so weird. But you know, I, I guess my advice is is to to uh, to listen to a lot of stuff and be curious and ask questions, um, and I I think getting into learning chord soloing and will start to open your ear and it'll it'll start to help you at least learn some new chord voicings. I mean, yeah. When I actually when I think about the Days of Wine and Roses, this this voicing, which is an F major seven nine, it's really that was in my arrangement by my teacher, Joe Negri. I don't know. I know there are a lot of folks from Europe, but folks in the United States might remember Mr. Rogers, kid show um, from Pittsburgh. Anyway, Joe Negri was a great jazz guitarist. He lived in Pittsburgh. He was a TV star. Anyway, this was the first chord in that first voicing in that arrangement. And to this day, whenever I play that voicing, I think of that arrangement. And whenever I play Days of Wine and Roses, I play that chord. So I think through learning tunes and learning arrangements and learning chord solos, if you're just getting into this music, you're going to learn a lot that way. You're going to learn a lot more. And actually, I just feel learning tunes learn a melody to a tune even you know 
if you don't learn all the chords, um, you'll learn, you'll remember more than just getting a book of scales and technique and knowing, hey, here's a diminished scale. It doesn't have much meaning unless you have a context to play it in. So, so I guess that's a thing. You know, sometimes I can I can come into a classroom and make a, a, a whole matrix of chord substitutions and stuff like that, and, and and people look at that like, what is that? But I didn't learn it that way. I can present it to you that way and and break it down. But the way I really learned to play was by playing music, it was by learning tunes, learn you know learning some rhythm guitar, get a real book and just play some rhythm guitar. Um. That's how you really learn. It's more fun that way than memorizing scales and diagrams and stuff like that. So I don't know. That's my advice: is just listen and 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 you know, start to learn some some arrangements, some chord arrangements of standards, and um, you know, get your feet get your feet wet that way. Don't worry about scales and I don't know. I don't worry about scale. If I don't worry about scales, you shouldn't really worry about them too much. <laughs> Uh, there's a question. Oh, okay. I, I, I'm going to pick this question out of here. I like to, the, okay. The question is, I don't know where you're from, but you have a cool name. Can you talk about basic enclosure patterns? And then there's another question. I'm not sure, Ron, if you could ask me this question, I'm not, I don't understand your question. Do you bebop all the major modes or just the one, two, five? I'm not sure what that means. Maybe i uh, find a way to ask that question a little differently I might be able to answer but this question about the enclosure so uh, this I'm gonna go back to my original topic about the core tones is so some sometimes people call these enclosures I call them melodic embellishments it's the same thing so there's a couple terms enclosures melod I call them melodic embellishments um, you might hear them called approach tones you might call hear them called target tones they're all the same thing. I like to call them melodic embellishments because psychologically it makes me think about being melodic, not so technical. But okay, so an example. Say I have, well, I'm on this, so I'm on this, got Days of Wine and Roses in my mind. I've got this uh, F major. Maybe you even start with the triad. I would say even start with the triad. Um, so I could. The basic one is to go chromatic below. And when I come down, so we could, I guess you could call that a basic enclosure. I call it chromatic below. And then, you know, just even using that, there's so much you can do with that rhythmically, right? So the second one would be to go diatonic above. So each chord tone, so I guess you got to know where those... I got to know where all those four tones of my F triad even. So if I go uh, diatonic above, and then when I come down, I stagger them. All right. So I'm 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 targeting all the chord tones diatonically above, and then I can combine them. So I think maybe this is that term enclosure is even a little bit more accurate because. I'm surrounding my target. So chromatic below, diatonic above, target. Below, above, target. Below, above, target. You've heard this. This is Western music right here, melodic development. Or So then there are variations on that. As far as I'm concerned, it's very worthwhile. It takes a lot of time. It's a discipline, but to explore. So instead of going below, above to my target, I go. It's good for my brain. Or, or so that, that would be a, a triplet pattern. I could also make that into a four note pattern. So I start on the target and I go away and above. Now, if you study classical music and classical composition, these are the same things that Bach used and Mozart used and every great melodic composer since you know beginning Western music. They might call them escape tone or neighbor tone, upper neighbor, lower neighbor. Same thing. Um, 
that's just a way to create melodies, right? So if I did uh, took that below above pattern to my F major triad, I go. So I'm starting on my target, target, below, above, target, target, below, above, target. And I'll tell you what, if you want chops, and you're serious about chops, you're like, yeah, I want some chops, get in the shed with those, baby. <laughs> All 12 keys. Get with that metronome slow and get those ripping, man. You'll have chops. Not only you have chops, but you'll have so much stuff to play when you go to solo. So I think the other thing about these, when you start to become aware of them, is that it helps you learn music so much faster because you start to understand there's a skeleton under there that's based on the chord tone, and then you have these embellishments around it. So it really helps you understand the content of a melodic line. So I, hopefully that answers your question, or hopefully it makes you a little bit more curious about that. So anyway, let me see what other questions are there. Do you play bebop scales on the major modes or just two, five, and one? I don't know. Well, I, I think what I'm trying to, I basically, I'm kind of basic. Uh, I use the major seven bebop scale. Uh, and I use the dominant seven bebop scale. Now I use them in different relationships to different chords to kind of expand the harmony. But again, the bebop scale is awesome, cool, will develop chops, but it's also not the answer to every thing. It, there are a lot of limitations to it. And and so just to give some background on this, uh, I would recommend to you to get. David Baker book, How to Play Bebop. It's one of the very first jazz curriculum books there was. When I was a kid, there was that book and there was Ray Ricker's Patterns for Jazz or something. And Jerry Coker. No, that was Jerry Coker. Anyway, long story short. Now, did Bird sit around and go, this is a bebop scale? No. This goes back to this thing about targeting chord tones whole point of a bebop scale is that you add this chromatic note so the chord tones are on the downbeat. It's all back to this thing that I'm obsessed with, which is harmonic clarity. So that's the point of a bebop scale. So it's not something like, well, I'm going to learn my bebop scales and, you know, great, I'm playing bebop. But, I, you know, I do use them, and, and they are a really effective tool. So the two, that I, the two basic ones I use, so I'll say, well, I'm in this F major thing. I, if I, I could use the F major bebop scale, so the major bebop scale has a passing tone between the sixth and the fifth degree. And the reason for that is because if you put that passing tone in there, all of the chord tones hit the downbeat. That's harmonic clarity. So if I start here on this F, so I'm going from root seven, six, and then I add that passing tone, flat six, five, four, three, two, one. And of course they can go up or down. The very opening phrase of Donna Lee. That's a bebop scale. If I take the little turn out of there. All right. So yeah, so if you it, when you play those bebop scales, you start them on the downbeat, so all the chords sit in the right place. So, so I guess David Baker stumbled upon this and named them the bebop scale. And to me, the wide... Did Bird play those, or why did Sonny Rollins play those, or why did what? Because they sounded good. Because adding that chromatic note puts the chord tone on the downbeat and makes it very clear what the harmony is. So, so again, this this would be if I had an F major seven chord or F six chord, and I've learned them three octaves, so it gives me a you know a wide range. You know, maybe just start with two octaves. So I could start it from the root of the chord. So if I have this F major seven. I could start it from the third of the chord. So I could really basically start from any chord tone. I could start from the fifth of the F. So I'm always thinking about the chord, right? 
So that's a major seven bebop scale. I can also play that over the relative minor. So I could play it on D minor. And it sets up all the chord tones of D minor really great too. So though that I use that one and I use the dominant seven one. So say I had F dominant seven. In the dominant seven bebop scale, you put the passing tone between the root and the flat seven. And that puts the root third, fifth, and flat seven on the downbeat. Harmonic clarity. It's almost like when the, you know, little sparkles and angels fly. Harmonic clarity. Yeah, I love it. Okay. So, of course, you can go up, start it from the root, third, from the fifth, or the flat seven. And I use that on the 2-5, so if I had F7, I'd use it on C minor 7, F7. I, there, there's a lot of places I can use it. So I, and one, that's because that's one of the things that I like to do is recycle something harmonically. So I actually, there's three ways I could use an F7 bebop scale. So put this up in there and let it spin around. We can talk about it later. I could use F7 bebop on an F7 chord. <laughs> I could use F7 on a D7 altered chord, so up a minor third. And I can use an F7 bebop on a B7 chord, the tritone sub. Those are the three uses of a dominant 7 bebop scale. That's kind of how I use it. I'd give you one other other references, Jerry Berganzi. Now, Jerry Berganzi has this book and altered bebop scales on stuff. I don't know. I never got that deep into it. I just try to use what I know sounds good to me and what I know how to use. So I, I just use either that major seven bebop scale or I use the dominant seven bebop scale, but I'll use it either as a natural dominant, an altered sus chord, or a tritone sub. So either that's hitting it for you or it's going whoop over your head and it'll just be something you'll be curious about and <laughs> we'll, we can talk about more in depth later um cool let me see uh what other questions we got here okay oh this is a good question ron yeah bebop skills are me memorizing licks that work out well it's a you know it's all those things. I mean, think about licks as, I mean, really, music is a language. And, uh, you know, you wouldn't be worth, you know, the price of salt as a blues guitarist if you didn't go. And you didn't do it. That's part of the language. You hear that, you know, that's blues, right? So licks are vocabulary words. So it is really good to learn licks. To be able to speak a language, right? <laughs> you know, um, but it, and I think through the licks you can learn a lot. And you know, we can't be a hundred percent swamis, you know, amazing creative geniuses every day. Sometimes you get to play some licks. So, so yeah, I think learning solos is a great thing. But also, you know, through the licks or like my fifty uh, licks thing, I. You know, my thought was, yeah, these are some cool licks, but try to dig a little deeper behind just a lick um, to the concept of the lick, lick uh, and the origin of the lick and, and all those things. So, yeah, licks are cool, you know, uh, starting place. And, and, I, and I mean, I think in the end, you, they, they're parts of the language that we all speak. You know, if, if I'm playing jazz with somebody, we have a language that we're speaking um and then to take it to to move the tradition forward like i was talking about kurt rosenwinkle he knows those he knows those solos he knows all that stuff um but he's taken the concepts now behind them and developed his voice you know from that tradition so that's that's what i think it, it it's a discipline and it takes time but uh, you know Back to the other thing I was saying is, if you really love the music and you're really curious, I mean, you don't understand, you know, I'm telling you, when I first heard jazz, I, I did not understand. I said, this 
was from another planet. And that intrigued me. Like, wow, these guys are either geniuses or they're totally crazy. And they were probably a little of both. But, <laughs> but yeah, man, learn some licks, learn some tunes, though. You know, learn, I think learning tunes is, you know, even better. Um, and then learn some, li and, then, and then apply the licks to the tunes, you know what I mean? They kind of have to all go together um, in terms of your development. So, anyway, let me see what other questions are there. So, oh, yeah, um, hey, Mojito, how are you doing? Um, yeah, I mean, so the I think the question, when you're playing solo, chord degrees needed, thirds and sevenths, always. Um, I mean, so I don't know if you mean if I'm playing just solo guitar or I'm playing a solo, thirds and sevenths. It's always a starting point or ending point. Otherwise, I'm not really playing the changes or the tune. So, again, you know, to just go back to the very first thing I was talking about is any tune that you're working on. I mean, if you came to me and said, hey, Cheryl, I want to go in the studio next week and record the song. And you gave me a song, and I never played it before. That's going to be my first meditation to learn the song. So I'm going to be prepared for the studio when we're going to go play or the concert. I'm going to really study and know where those places are. Where where are the thirds and sevenths? That's how I'm going to learn the tune. I'll have sort of the map and blueprint of the tune, not only on the instrument, but in my ear. That's how I'm going to hear the song. So then by the time we get to play it, I'm going to be free. I'm not going to... I'm not going to feel restricted because um, I've I got it in, I've got it internalized through that it's sort of a little inner blueprint of the of the song. So yeah, Steve. Hey man. <laughs> so yeah, Steve. That's funny. Yes, he's talking about uh, go hear live music because that's the other thing. Yeah, first first jazz guitars I ever saw for real. I mean, besides my teacher, you know, who's great jazz guitarist was, but Tal Farlow, which was amazing because he'd been in retirement. So, you know, this was in the eighties, he came out of retirement. I was a kid and, you know, my mom let me skip school and went down and, and, you know, that was life changing, but there, there is so much that you see on a live gig. And it mean, believe me, it's amazing that we have we can communicate. I'm communicating to people all over the world, which is blowing my mind. But you know, we we could. I never saw a video of West Montgomery. Are you kidding me? We didn't have that when I was a kid. But you know, you can see that. But it'll never substitute. There's so much. It's like that chi. You know, you got to get that energy. You see how the band interacts, and you feel how what, how that's happening. It's you know, it's improvised music. Is 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 a deep language, and people are communicating with each other and with you in the audience. Actually, you're part of it. If it wasn't for you, the bands would just be playing for a bunch of chairs. It's no fun. <laughs> anyway, what else do we got in there? Hey, man, wow, man, this is so cool. Hey, thank you, True Fire folks, because you set this stuff up and, um, you know, through the Sherpa and through all these courses, I've met so many people all over the world. Um, I have to say, you know, I've met when I'm on the road and I'm in Europe or I'm in Asia and someone comes up to me and, you know, either we've interacted through True Fire or and I see someone and, you know, wow, you're three dimensional. I mean, it's, it got, it's kind of mind blowing and it's, it's amazing. Thanks to Brad and, and Jeff and Rand and everybody to make these platforms happen because it's truly unbelievable. Um, that we can all be having this conversation. So, yeah, we got a couple more minutes. Any other, any things that I didn't touch on or burning questions that maybe I could just send you on or give you some ideas, maybe something to, to you know, inspire you, get your curiosity going. <laughs> That's cool. Awesome. Yeah, we just, uh, we're going to be doing some, um, Blues etudes. I wrote some blues etudes, you know, bebop blues etudes, and um, I'm really I'm excited about. It. It's super fun, super fun for me to do that. How do you improvise without a blank in my mind? Mm, wow, that that's a good question. 
Well, you know what? The more that you, you know, when you practice, you're developing habits. So the more prepared, I'll have to just, I can only say for myself, the more prepared I am, that I feel prepared, I've done my homework, I know, you know, I know the melody, I know where the chord tones are, I know whatever, and whatever, this could be jazz tune, it could be rocky. Um, the more prepared I am, I'll bring that to the bandstand. And, and maybe sometimes it's just going out there and doing it a lot till you feel comfortable. I had someone come to me the other day, said they, they, practiced, they went and they sat in and they just went blank. Now they haven't sat in very much. So it, that's part of the experience too. And, and you got, you know, it takes a lot of courage to do that. But it's, you know, if you don't do it, you won't get better at it. So what I would say to you is encourage you to just keep showing up and doing it and having that courage to get up and play with others. Because before you know, it, you'll be able to get that presence of mind and go, oh, yeah, I remember the court, you know. That's a great feeling. So, so hang in there. You know, if you're just getting started out, it's it takes a lot of courage. And I I tip my hat, you know, to anyone who wants to go out and and do this. I mean, it's it's great. It's a great use of our time, really, on this planet is to play, study music, and play with others. So, whatever you can do, you'll get better at it the more you do it. Trust me. Trust me. So, uh, what else have we got? My right hand, wow. Um, okay, briefly, I'm going to talk about this because I do get a lot of questions about it. I do have an odd, I guess, uh, you know who I'd recommend to you to really explain this great is Tuck Andrus. Apparently, he has a rant on his webpage about this. The principle, now some people call it Benson picking, right? The principle comes from classical guitar. In terms of, you want to medium pick like a fender medium or something i use these dunlops it's the thickness of a human fingernail right so classical people have long tradition of tone production and they figured out the right length and thickness of a nail here's your nail so if you think about your plectrum or your pick is your nail and the angle so if i get a little better view of my hand. So if I was playing classical guitar, I'd probably want my fingers to come in at this angle. So think about if my pick was just at that there, except I hold it there. And so that's the principle. So uh, you can't overplay the string for one thing. So, so it has to do with the thickness, the angle, and also the attack. When I used to play this way, I used to be able to play fast but I always got that sound I hate that sound never liked it you can't you won't get that sound with this because you play much lighter and in fact the lighter you play the more tone you get from the string so without if you play too heavy that pinging is noise cancellation you're not letting the string and all the harmonics to vibrate at their fullest potential you're cutting it out so the lighter you play the more tone you get. So that's the trick to it. That, that's the quickest way I can describe the principles behind it. How to get there is very difficult. It's heart-wrenching. It was very hard to learn how to do change. So it, you know, if you want to talk to me about it in more detail, if you play fast this way and you like it and it's great, don't change it. If you like the tone, I mean, that's really what made me do it was the tone. I love the tone of it. That was the motive. It sounds beautiful. So I wanted to make a more beautiful mm -hmm. sound. And then it turned out I could actually play faster. Okay. That was a nice benefit. Um, so that, at least you can get an overview. But I, check out Tuck Andrus's page. He digs into it like to the millisecond, millimeter, inch, and hold it like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's the idea. So that's a good question. And what else we got? What are the best resources to learn the concepts described earlier? So thirds and sevenths, I hope. Well, hopefully take some time and, and, and think about that, you know, to know even just off the top of your head, hey, what's the third and seventh of a C major seven chord? If it's not clear here, it ain't going to be clear here. Uh, 
this plays the guitar. If I just move my fingers around, that's not making music, right? It's got to come from consciousness. So, so I always am saying to folks, the more stuff, the concepts you can think about music away from your instrument, when you get to your instrument, you've already practiced it a thousand times. So I guess I'd leave you with that. I think we're out of time. But wow, I hope you enjoyed it. This was wild. I hope to do another one if, if you have me back. And uh, keep in touch. Uh, Sherpa program or any of my courses. And uh, if you're in New York, come see me at the Blue Note on Sunday. I'll be there on Sunday. And uh, I guess that I guess we're that's it. But you know, go back to those chord tones. Whatever level you are, you're not too advanced for it. You're not too uh, much of a beginner for it. Trust me, it's it's the essence of it all. So anyway, peace out, and uh, hope to see you around.